I just uploaded or a couple of days ago a video where I asked uh, sort of a rhetorical or hypothetical question um, or challenged or dared people to imagine a set of circumstances or a, a reality or whatever under which they would be okay, I guess, not necessarily in favor of, but not really objecting to um, the ritual slaughter of animals. I got a bunch of responses. Um, most of them, if you ask me, were pretty good. And most people sort of took the question the way I hoped that it would be taken, relatively seriously, and trying to deal with it, as opposed to just going, oh my god, that's just something that we can't allow, or, oh yeah, I'd love to see that. No, that's, that wasn't what I was looking for. Um, although, in a sense, I was looking for responses for that, because that too, if you feel like, I don't know, what one, one, most people might say is an unhealthy aversion to it, or an unhealthy attraction to it bloodlust or moral panic or something like this, these two. Um, I was looking for something kind of in between, and um, someone named Killer Tofu sort of listed a whole bunch of interesting um, circumstances or perspectives on the matter that doesn't really blur the issue. In, in many ways, if you ask me, it clarifies it by approaching it seriously and dispassionately. What does this, what do I deep down feel about this? <clears throat> um, and as I say, with the, with the two polarities, bloodlust versus shock, um, moral panic or whatever, that is, I would say, the person feeling those emotions is being led by their emotions, led by their sense of revulsion. They're not in control of their belly, as it were. They're not in control of their gut-level reactions. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, because, of course, there are always circumstances under which this is going to happen. If I see someone close to me being mistreated, especially horribly mistreated, it's not a sign of weakness, although I guess arguably it is, but it's it, it, it's understandable if I were to be horribly shocked by this and completely lose control of myself. Uh, by the same token, if I suddenly found myself in a situation where there were 20 naked women um, geared up to please me in every possible way, I might be overwhelmed by the desire to cheat on my wife. Um, this doesn't mean that I approve of these reactions in myself. It just means that I've been overpowered by them, as it were. I've lost control of myself. Um, <clears throat> to me, the issue here is, the interesting issue is, can I face this, this ritual slaughter of animals thing, and not, as it were, lose it, not, as it were, lose control of the steering wheel of my own mental, emotional, psychological state. And I go in there and watch this taking place and not have a reaction that overpowers me. Like, one of my favorite movies ever was Apocalypse Now, and it was about a fellow who believed strongly in the dichotomy of good and evil, and he was... It was implied he was sucked into the dark side because he switched from a black-white conception of the universe to a white-black conception. Good became evil and evil became good. He didn't abandon the di dichotomy. I'm talking about Walter Kurtz, Marlon Brando's character. Um, also implied the, the original Kurtz in the, in the novel Heart of Darkness kind of went the same way. He just experienced things that altered him completely. Um, <clears throat> and he was 
in a sense, broken by his experiences, even though it was implied it kind of made him stronger, but it also destroyed him. Um, I went into Kaligat Kali Temple in Calcutta, and I witnessed there the ritual slaughter of goats. You go into the temple and there's... It's a small temple in central, so it's slightly south central Calcutta, the old part of the city, right where City of Joy was, by the way. Um, and it's actually one of the cleaner parts of the city now, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> where there is the ritual slaughter of goats taking place almost constantly in the temple to the deity Kali, which is a deity that kind of fascinates me for a number of reasons, and I don't really have time to go into that, and, or nor into the nuances of my fascination with this. I'm almost never prepared to say this, but essentially I'm an atheist. I don't believe in any gods, and I, you know, it, it just, woo just doesn't work on me, or at least I hope it doesn't work on me. <clears throat> I tend to see almost all of religion and everything as just sort of a poetic or intuitive means of understanding the world around me and above all myself because I'm a human being and as Jung said we have two ways of apprehending things we have the rational and the intuitive and to me all ritual and all that is simply a way of approaching things with that side of oneself. Now, it's very easy to lose control of oneself because the intuitive has virtually no rules. You have to sort of, you have to intuit your way into things, whereas the rational side has rules. <clears throat> can you so train your intuitive side that you can approach things and not be horrified by them? Well, I, that, that interests me, so I put it to the test. Um, the preponderance of Hinduism, in fact, almost all of Hinduism, is extremely respectful of animals and opposed to violence towards animals. And I would say probably at least half of practicing Hindus are vegetarian um, by conviction. They just will not eat meat. They follow the, you know, the ideas of ahimsa, non-violence, and all this sort of thing. And most Hindus find what goes on in, in certain aspects of Hinduism, Tantra in particular, especially Bengali Tantra, as, I don't know, just strange. And I, I wish these people didn't do this and um, this sort of thing. But there's no attempt to, to denounce it utterly, at least in sort of religious terms or in philosophical terms. Um, but it's just, it just runs against most of Hindu thinking, killing animals, you, Hinduism, you, you know, stereotypically Hindus don't behave like this. Well, they do in Bengal and in other parts of India and, um, animals are slaughtered right in or on the, on the, uh, threshold of temples. Um, a goat is brought in. The goats that they kill are actually spoiled rotten right up until the moment they're killed. Um, they've, as far as farm animals go, they have a pretty good life. Uh, the goat is brought in. Its head is wedged into a sort of a V-shaped wedge so it can't get out. The legs are pulled back and they, with the flesh. A particular ritual sword is used to behead the goat. It probably has maybe... I'd say 10 seconds, perhaps less of unpleasantness, and then it it goes into its, its head, heads off. All prior to that, it's, um, I don't know, it's spoiled as far as animals go. And now I'm not trying to justify this. I'm not trying to say that this is a good thing or a beautiful thing. Some, some Westerners go there, and again, from a, an apocalypse now in one of the climactic scenes, uh, you do see people ritually killing um, Carabao, which is a water buffalo in the Philippines. It's supposedly taking place in Vietnam, but it was shot in the Philippines. 
And the people up in the mountains do this. They get a very large bolo, which is a big machete, and they wham, hit the bullock or the buffalo right in the back of the neck with it. You can't really slice a, a buffalo's head off with one shot, but it that's as close as you can do. And it, the spine is severed. The, the buffalo is killed instantly. Um, and you, when you watch the movie Hearts of Darkness, um, I think it was called that, or uh, whatever, uh, Filmmaker's Apocalypse, they interviewed um, Francis Ford Coppola's wife, who said that she thought that the whole thing was beautiful. I wouldn't agree with that. Um, <clears throat> I would say that it sort of simply is. It's not good or bad. It just depends on what's in one's mind. Um, again, there's a certain degree of exoticization that takes place in contexts like that, like when people go and see the, the, um, the way that... Aboriginal Canadians who live traditionally uh, deal with animals. Um, you know, the obvious case being the Innu. I don't know if anyone does this anymore. But within living memory, you'd get Innu, who are the colloquially known as Eskimos. They find a particular air bubble in the vast sheets of ice that, that are up in the high Arctic. And they wear really warm clothes. And they stand there and they look down, they bend down look into the, into the hole, well, wait, having placed a little tuft of fur in a particular spot. Now, they're, the reason why they do this is it's sort of this little, it's an air hole that they know that a seal will eventually come up to look for air. And the little tuft of fur that they pulled off, like their, you know, the, the frill of fur that they have around their parkas, they put that down. As soon as that gets disturbed, they know that there's a seal down there. And then they have um, um, a spear in their hand, and one shot, the spear goes deeply into the seal's head, right into its face, basically, and deep down into its body. Kills it instantly. <clears throat> but the fascinating thing from the Westerner's point of view is the fact that the native Canadian guy, the, the Innu, just bends over, and stares at this um, air pocket under the ice, sometimes for hours and hours. Now, I'm familiar enough with the native Canadians to know that they have, you know, many of them, especially the, the real native people that live up north and live um, close to their traditional ways, their minds are different from people that were born and bred in cities. That's just that's how it works when you're that rural um, or that, I don't know, um, natural, I guess. You have a different mentality, a different mindset. Um, boredom means something different to you than it does to somebody else. So they have the mental capacity to stand there, stooped over like that for hours, staring at this little tuft of fur, waiting for the seal to arrive. As the seal arrives, they pray, here I am, seal, come and get me, here, come and, come and offer yourself to me. Um, you know, you know, the usual, I won't, I'll make sure you don't suffer, I'll, um, you know, I'll kill you quickly, I won't waste any of your body. Um, you know, the, the gods have deemed that this is the way things are, and, uh, you know, it's like a contract that he's signed with the seal, and the seal is just going to go and offer himself to the Inu's spear. Now that's sort of the, the slightly exoticizing view of um, how traditional societies approach animal slaughter. There is a assumed bond between the victim and the slaughterer, I guess. Um, there's an assumed symbiosis there. The, and not only that, the assumption is, I'm only going to take what I need. I'm only doing this because I need what you have. And I'm not going to go out there and massively hunt all of you and kill you all off just so I can get rich on seal blubber or something like this. No, I'm just, just going to take what me and my family require. The rest I will leave strictly alone. And, you know, I'll thank you for it, what you have done. Um, I, I suppose from the... Inu's point of view, uh, from the hunter's point of view, 
that's a lot healthier than complete disregard and indifference towards the animals, which is kind of our way of doing it, <clears throat> to a bloodlust where you're wallowing in slaughter. Um, it's kind of a happy median, I guess, right? Um, killing other animals is, in some sense, some sense that we understand a profound thing to do. And it can sometimes corrupt us. So this would be a means in, in which the Innu have found not to become corrupted by the act of killing. There are very, there's a specific reality behind it all that they obey. Now, I don't know if this, <clears throat> if this really reflects what's going on when Bengali Hindus ritually slaughter goats. I can't tell what's going on inside somebody's mind. It wouldn't surprise me if most of the people that are going to the temple, if you got into their heads what they were looking for, well, they had a fight with their wife and they hope that this calms things down inside their house because the domestic disharmony is driving them mad. So they're going to go slaughter a goat to Kali and hopefully get some sort of blessing from this. Wouldn't surprise me at all if that's what most people actually do. They want something out of this. It's, you know, kind of like the original like ancient Greek and Roman contract between them and the gods. If you do this for me, I'll do that for you. <clears throat> this kind of isn't what I'm referring to here. Uh, but, but even then, when you think about that, it's, you're just fulfilling a contract. It's not the same thing as um, blindly slaughtering an animal because you just don't care about it. You're saying that, no, no, this is a profound thing that I'm doing, and this is profound enough that the gods will pay attention because I'm killing something, which is something that, in most contexts is seen as an anathema, absolutely forbidden. But under these specific circumstances, if I tell the gods what I'm doing, and they can see into my heart, they see that my, heart's, my heart is pure, etc., I'm not really doing anything bad, and I'm not doing it just for the sake of making the animals suffer. <clears throat> now, you can't get into anyone's head and find out if, they're actually believe, if they actually believe all of this. I've often wondered if anyone who ever said that they believed in God actually ever does. I have no, I have no way of knowing whether or not any of the theists that I know actually believe. So, again, I can't say that if somebody is bringing a goat to Kaligat Temple to have it suffer, to have it slaughtered, that they're doing it for the right reasons. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but to me, the whole point of it is something similar. It's, look, we exist. To exist is to make other things suffer. Suffering and death aren't as bad as you think they are. If you train yourself to face them and see them for what they actually are, they're 100% natural. And <clears throat> taking a goat in and neatly and surgically, which is how they do it, slaughtering it, and in as much as it's possible, painlessly, and without trauma or fear. Um, it's about as close as I've seen <clears throat> for a, I don't know, what would I call it, a healthy approach to death? Because, you know, you go to Southeast Asia and you see things like cock fights and brutal boxing matches and things like that. And the over the, the overwhelming feeling I get is this isn't healthy. This isn't good. Um, because you're actually there to, to engage in bloodlust. And that's perhaps under very controlled circumstances, you might be able to gain something out of dancing around smeared with blood. But I'd say that that's dodgy at best. And in fact, it's probably a very good way to feed your demons, your inner demons. And, and by that, I just mean your, your inner psychological states that you'd rather not wallow in. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of the same thing as, oh, um, if I drink a liter or four liters of wine, I'll commune with Dionysus. But who the hell is going to be communing with me the next morning? You know, it's, it, there are consequences to this. And I feel the same way about cruelty and things like that. Regardless of how bad it is for the subject of the cruelty, or rather the object, 
it's in many ways just as bad as the subject, the person who's actually engaged in the cruelty. It's, it's a vice, and it's a seriously corrupting vice, uh, unless you're really careful. It's like drinking that vat of wine. While you're doing it, you might get somewhere, but you're going to come down as fast as an express elevator afterwards, and you're going to be faced with all this, literally, this blood on your hands, and say, oh, this isn't kind of what I intended. Um, <clears throat> again, that's the assumption behind the movie Apocalypse Now. You keep going into that heart of darkness, and eventually you're going to, your quote-unquote good side will reassert, will reassert itself, and you won't be very pleased with what has happened, and you'll be a much lesser person than before you started it. Now, when I went in there, I was going in not as not with an anthropologist's point of view. I, I wasn't interested in studying the mindset or the culture of Bengali Hindus, particularly tantric Hindus that do this. Um, <clears throat> that didn't interest me because ultimately my point of view is I don't know what's going on in their heads, so forget it. It's not important. So I just went in and I just observed it all. And again, I was observing it at the same time as I was observing myself. I was thinking, okay, Andy, what's your reaction to all of this? And I have to say that my reaction to it was, <clears throat> I was kind of underwhelmed by it. Like, I rarely eat meat, um, but I don't shy away from it. It just, I, the food that I like to eat mostly is vegetarian. I haven't eaten meat now in weeks. <clears throat> um, I like, I like to think that I'm kind to animals, um, I'm excessively kind to my cat. I've just moved all of my furniture into sealable rooms inside of my house because he's getting old and he's pissing and shitting everywhere, all over my furniture, all over my house. And now I'm faced with the horrible dilemma. What do I got to do? Well, he's approaching the end of his days. I've got to bring him somewhere to get him euthanized eventually. Not a pleasant prospect. Um, but sometimes these things are necessary, right? Um, and I won't, I won't, I'll be saddened by what I was, by, by what I do when I eventually do take him in somewhere to get put down. But I, I don't think I'm going to, it's going to be a moral issue. It's just, I understand that morally, that I kind of didn't have any options because I understand that I have a love connection with my cat. I look back on how I lived with him for the last 15 years and it was a very pleasant experience. He loved to sit in my lap and purr and everything. Eventually, he's going to have to be killed. Uh, or maybe he'll just tip over himself before I, you know, take him in to prevent him from suffering anymore. Because <clears throat> he's getting old, right? He had a really good life, to be honest. Um, but now it's coming to its end. <clears throat> That's sort of the approach that I was getting from the whole ritual slaughter at Kaligat to the goddess Kali. And we all know that Kali has this terrifying blood-smeared Hindu goddess. Tara is even more so. Um, but again, I got no great sense of profundity. It was just, okay, now this is, this is just kind of a small slaughterhouse abattoir. And goats are regularly slaughtered here. That, and it just happens to be attached to the temple of a goddess that is particularly ferocious and, in a sense, even bloodthirsty. <clears throat> but again, she's a goddess, right? And again, remember, I don't believe in gods. I'm looking for a psychological, emotional, intellectual state. What, what does this evoke in me? Well, it, it, as I say, it evoked precious little. But I wasn't disgusted by it. The, the area where the slaughtering is taking place is pretty filthy, as you can imagine, in a place where animals are regularly slaughtered. The floors are wet, dirty, there's flowers being trampled underfoot all the time, and, you know, unfortunately bits of body fluid from the goats gets on the floor, and you're walking around barefoot in it, and there is that peculiar smell that abattoirs have. There's an abattoir not that far from where I live, and it's a distinctive smell. And so, you know, there's a lot in there that would turn most people's stomachs, but 
for some reason this stuff doesn't bother me. I don't particularly like it either. Um, the goats are kind of pleasant looking little animals and I certainly wouldn't want to hurt them. But I would have no objection, I guess, to swatting a, a mosquito if it landed on me. <clears throat> so goats are cute, so I don't want them to get hurt. But again, that's sublogical, right? But when I was watching it, and I sort of prepared myself for it, I really didn't think that, it, uh, as I said, I was underwhelmed. Uh, it, it didn't have the profound or the profundity that I was not really expecting or seeking, but seeing if it was there. It's almost as if you went to do something profound, and it turned out to be sort of, you tried to scream and it came out like a yawn, I guess. Uh, from that song. <laughs> um, so, again, I, I guess I left that that whole experience seeing it more or less in the same way that most Hindus see it. Well, it's vaguely abhorrent. I wouldn't do it, but I don't really feel like suppressing their right to do it either um, because they've been doing this since time immemorial. And it's, you know, I can say that that's awful that they do it, but I'm only doing it based on my everything that life and my civilization has prepared me to, to view it as. They're doing it the same way. So in order for me to judge these people or judge the act itself, I have to see it completely from their perspective. I don't have the capacity to do that. So I, I just ended up seeing it dispassionately, and I thought, well, all right. And, but again, not, oh, this is horrible, and I had to run out of there and wash these images out of my mind along with the filth that had collected between my toes and on my feet. No, I didn't feel that way at all. I even went out and stood there and watched them slaughtering or butchering the goats, and these guys know what they're doing. They can have a goat neatly butchered, butchered inside of, I don't know, two or three minutes, or it looks like it. <clears throat> and, you know, you see the blood running down into the gutter, onto their feet and things like that, and they're going about this just as you would see, you know, if you've ever seen people in places like... Um, you know, the, the, the market areas in France, like the butchering is all often done right out in, in the open, where after the animal is killed, they carve it up right in front of everybody, and oftentimes people want to see that happening to see how fresh the meat is. Um, and again, it wasn't foul. I, I didn't find it disgusting when, you know, you slit the stomach open and the bowels come out and fall on the ground and everything. Like most, you know, I think most city-bred people would just say, oh, I don't want to be here. This is horrible. But again, they will have lost control of their experience of the matter, right? And some people, I suppose, would go, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to make that goat suffer. Um, yeah, sure. But again, they have been corrupted by it, uh, you know, or they've been, they've lost control of their experience of it. I went in there, I saw it, I noted it, I walked out and I thought, okay, I was going to go to a place called Terapith after this, where it's even crazier, I guess one would say, um, where they really take tantric Hinduism to its, I wouldn't say extreme, but conclusion, where there's things like alcohol and drugs and um, things like that involved in the practices, and you're actually lauding the ferocity of the goddess. I, you know, I, I decided now that this is enough um, because I think that this strain of, of um, this line of thinking kind of isn't, doesn't do it for me. Um, again, it wasn't that I was horrified by it, but I thought, all right, I've seen this and I know it and it's just not something that I'm interested in. <clears throat> Far more profound to me was watching the corpses slowly decompose at the burning ghats in Baranasi, uh, the Manikarnika ghat, where the, the funeral pyres never go out. You're always seeing people there, um, or their remains being slowly consumed by the flames, and the ceremonies that take place there, and the large number of people standing or sitting and watching, silently and respectfully. That was profound to me. And I guess the difference is, first of all, they're humans. But secondly, they're already dead, and they died more or less without human intervention. They weren't murdered or whatever. Um, 
And it's not seen as an unhealthy spectacle in Hinduism. In fact, it's seen as somewhat healthy to go down there and see yourself for what you really are. This is you next, right? Uh, like you see in um, a lot of graveyards in traditionally Catholic countries written in Latin over the entry to the graveyard. We were once like you and you will once be, you will um, eventually be like us. A healthy reminder, carpe diem, the omnia transient, all this sort of thing. That's, I think the phenomenon or the, the practice is called ma shamshan, where you just watch corpses being cremated. That too is not a pretty sight. Um, watching a corpse being cremated while well, the brain boils inside the skull sometimes and the skull explodes or the the um, <clears throat> abdomen swells up because the stuff inside is boiling and, the, and it all spills out everywhere. But it's not ghoulish in that the people are already dead. And it does seem healthy because you, you, you really are sort of pondering the fact that this, something like this, is in your future. Um, one day, everything you see here will be just so much meat that has to be disposed of. Uh, so much useless meat that will have to be disposed of. I'll just be an empty carcass. And I don't find that depressing to see that. Um, a lot of people I find have sort of frightening views of death, they have necrophobia that is unhealthy. And I would say that people like that might actually benefit from this. They might actually say, oh, it's after a while, after looking at it long enough, you could see it as a non-event, just like slaughtering the goats in Kaligat. Um, to me, it was <clears throat> very somber. Um, I won't say it was pleasant, but it was very sort of deep and profound and numinous, I guess. Whether you believe in any woo or not, being that close to the presence of human mortality and the transitory nature of everything does have an effect on you. And I'd go there at all hours of the day. Like it's particularly powerful when you go at night because there's far fewer spectators and it's dark, which adds a particular element of somberness to it all. And there's quiet, like the huge mobs of people that you see wandering around and down by the Ganges and Varanasi are not there at night. But it's not, or I didn't feel like it was horrifying, even though a lot of people might, because this is taking place in a dark place and you have all these temple buildings in the background that are just lit by the funeral pyres. And it could, if you're so inclined, look pretty eerie. Um, <clears throat> and the, the back alleys behind there, which I had to negotiate every night to get back to my temple, that temple, <laughs> hotel, uh, are poorly lit. So you've, you know, a lot of people wouldn't be able to do that. They'd sit there looking at the corpses. They say, all right, enough of this. I, I, this is just a bit too morbid for me. And then they'd have to walk back through the poorly lit, very narrow streets that are almost like canyons because the buildings are fairly tall, five, six stories. Um, and I think that most people would find it a very unpleasant, frightening experience. And you're passing by temples, a lot of them, um, to Shiva and Kali, who are the, the gods associated with death, destruction, completion, etc. But I found it actually an affirming overall experience. Again, I think that I stayed in control of it. I wasn't horrified when, you know, I saw something particularly gruesome taking place on the funeral pyres. Most of the time it's not. It's just the bodies are slowly consumed by the fires. But you've got to be ready for the shots when they do happen. And then when I walked back, it wasn't a frightening darkness. It was a, a very profound kind of weird darkness, but not horrifying. Um, the weird images painted on the walls in the back alleys of um, women with big swords in their hands and bare breasts and things like that, um, slaughtering animals or demons or something like that, didn't look sinister. Um, 
They didn't look alluring or anything like that. It wasn't as if I wanted to suddenly do all of this. Um, but it was like, okay, I've gotten closer to a profound truth, and I can handle it. In fact, something in me wants to understand all of this. I might not want to engage in it. I might not want to sit there forever, but I want to absorb some of this because it it's preparing me for what's ahead of me in life, right? Um, death is a fact of existence. Now, that's what I get out of these things. And this is kind of what I was vaguely exploring in Kaliga. And it was, as I say, it was kind of a non-event. The most um, interesting experience I had in Kali God was simply when I bought this silly thing, which is just an image of the goddess Kali, one of these cheap mass-produced uh, uh, images that you see sold outside of any Hindu temple of any repute, um, <clears throat> especially the really famous ones. And it was kind of interesting because I thought that this, you know, very evocative and everything of a goddess that, from a poetic uh, perspective, I'm fascinated by. Buying a stupid mass-produced souvenir had a more profound effect on me than watching goats being slaughtered. Um, even though I'm, again, in a nuanced sense, I'm an atheist. I don't believe that this god exists. I don't. And you're going to have a hard time convincing me that it does. But I understand the state of mind in the Jungian sense that this represents and this is what fascinates me. And I thought this is precisely the image that, you know, I, that might kind of trigger that kind of thing in me. So, you know, buying a dumb trinket actually had a more profound effect on me. Um, Mass-produced modern junk uh, than the profound ceremony taking place, ritual slaughter. But again, the most profound of all was watching um, the corpses being burned in Varanasi. Um, was it life-changing? No, not really. Um, I would say the overall trip itself might be, yes. But the experiences that I got, which I kind of was wondering whether or not they would strike me as profound, turned to be not that profound. Um, no, but not that horrifying either. I would certainly never want to put a stop to what goes on in Kaligat. It's like, that's your thing. In order for me to sort of put a stop to what you're doing on moral grounds, I would have to have the capacity to judge you morally, and I can't do that because I, I'm not walking a mile in your shoes, as it were. I'm not you. I'm not this person, and there's probably lots morally that these people would object to to me. Not least of which, the fact that I was sexually promiscuous for 44, well, no, for up until the age of 44, until I got married. Um, that's, that's not how Indian society works at all. So they would probably object to me and think that I'm immoral for that reason. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to judge them for, you know, by my yardstick either. So, <clears throat> the thought experiment for me uh, was when I was actually doing it, was when I was actually there. I was seeing if I would end up wallowing in it or end up being shocked by it, and it was neither. Um, but it doesn't mean that profundity was not on my radar at the time, because I had some profound experiences in India. That wasn't one of them. Um... But I can see how certain people might sort of find it, as, again, the Francis Ford Coppola's wife did, a beautiful thing to watch these goats being slaughtered. Look, this is just, if I dare say it, Mother Kali drawing us back into herself. This is the way that the, the Ramakrishna-type um, Bengali Hindus see it. Mother Kali is simply, we come from her, we come from the phenomenal universe, we were nothing, and now we are something. The universe molds us into something. We come out of, you know, we're, we're just a pile of atoms, and then we coalesce into something which is this, okay? And then eventually, we disintegrate, and we merge back into the 
phenomenal universe the way that we came. But something goes on. Um, consciousness. <clears throat> Mistranslated, I think, a lot as the soul. Um, but again, I don't want to get into that. That's kind of a theological argument, but it's a little bit more thought out, I guess, than just sacrificing animals to a god. You're simply saying that life and death are kind of the same things on the same continuum, and whatever is born must be, must eventually go back to where it came from, into nothingness. Um, you note that uh, Kali is often, usually predict, uh, um, depicted as being black, and blackness is the color in which all other colors merge. And, you know, you come out of black and then you go back into darkness and that's just what we are. That's kind of the way I saw it. And if I'm going to see animals being killed or whatever, I was sort of searching for that kind of reaction and it just didn't happen in me. It could be happening in plenty of other people. I don't know. Um, you know, a lot of cultures do say that Observing death is good for you because you see what you are, right? You understand what life is. <clears throat> In the West, we tend to hide from death. Um, not all of us, but we tend to. But it just comes out in our subconscious, of course. Like I say, when you turn on the television and see zombie apocalypse shows or whatever, that's our subconscious being fed, of course, even though we otherize it and say that that's something other than me. That's these horrible zombies that want to attack me. No, no, that's just you expressing itself because the rep, the other part of you wants to repress it. Um, but I, I, as I say, I never, I, I didn't get a sense of great horror in it or revulsion, even the filth of the, the, the area where the animals are being butchered. I'd been to wet markets in Southeast Asia a lot. So I'm kind of used to that. The, the, the thought of, it's still not nice, especially on a hot day when you go into a place where a lot of pigs are being slaughtered all the time. The smell is horrible. And what you see isn't nice either. That, that, that's kind of stomach churning stuff. And Kaligat wasn't anywhere near as bad as that. It was rather sanitized as far as slaughterhouses go. In fact, uh, there's plenty of slaughterhouses in the city that I live in. It's a city that basically lives off agriculture and food processing. I've never gone into any of the abattoirs here, and I have no desire to do that. I'd probably vomit. Uh, but Kaligat didn't have that effect on me, even though it had all the sort of signs of, a, of an abattoir. Um, but one thing, one very strong impression I got is this somewhat ambiguous nature of even are taboos. Like we, as I said at the beginning of this video, we have a taboo against killing things, whether we realize it or not. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I won't say it's a good thing because taboos are sublogical, right? You just have to be, you have to say, look, this is just an anathema. I can't go along with this under any circumstances. And the response, the emotional response that makes me disgusted by this is good. I have to maintain this and I have to demonstrate to everybody else that I am disgusted by it. Um, and of course there is the danger that I might actually like it. But again, we have to anathemize that and say that's serial killer stuff, that's zombies, that's Hannibal Lecter, all this kind of thing. So again, you're not neutral anymore. Or not even neutral anymore. You're not in control. Um, and I think that's most people's view of the matter. This is just too intense for us to think about like this. So we have to put an absolute value on it. Don't go near that. Don't think this through. Don't open that door because the consequences are pretty awful if you screw it all up. And most people would screw it all up because most people don't self-examine and they don't want to sort of have their certainties examined. Um, not all places operate like that, of course. And again, Bengal, the Indian state of Bengal, is a place that's known for this. For not so much calculated blasphemy, but calculatedly approaching stuff that most people consider taboo. Conscious taboo violation is a very big part of Bengali Hinduism, or at least a preponderance of Bengali Hinduism. And I can see the value of taboo violation um, because taboos are 
meant to frighten you away. You don't do this under any circumstances, no matter what, and there's no excuse for it ever, period, end of story. That's not, in my opinion, a healthy way to think about things. At least after a certain point. Eventually you have to take control of your emotional reactions to things. You don't want to suppress them. You don't want to repress them. But you want to take control of them. You want to sort of see what's happening to you. You want to understand why you feel a certain way, why you feel this sense of shock and sense of sin at taboo violation. Violating taboo and doing all this stuff is never an end in itself. It's simply to say, okay, now you're, you're moving beyond the normal rules that most people have to live by because you're progressing. Um, you're actually seeing taboos and anathemas for what they are. But it doesn't mean that you're going to go the opposite way, the way Kurtz did in Apocalypse Now. You're going to, as it were, transcend this dichotomy of good and evil. It doesn't mean that you go whole hog into the dark side. In fact, that's, that's held up as a good reason not to engage in this kind of activity or this kind of thinking until you're bloody ready for it. Because again, you'll have the experience that Zapfe had in The Last Messiah, if you're not careful, or that the caveman had in The Last Messiah. You'll see this if you're not ready for it, and it could shock you to the depths of your soul. You might see things in your heart of hearts that you simply didn't believe was there. In many ways, I think this did happen to an entire generation of German people in the 1930s. They got into something that they didn't really understand, and it took control of them. They lost their minds. Or I would say they lost their hearts. They lost control of where their emotions were taking them. They dabbled in the dark side good is bad and bad is good type thing. I, in many ways, that was what Nazism strikes me as. That's the danger. That's the danger, you know, about um, Saruman in The Lord of the Rings staring too long into the Palantir. You know, the Nietzschean thing, you stare into the abyss, and the abyss stares back into you. Um, notice Nietzsche didn't say don't stare into the abyss, but you better know what you're doing when you do. And if you train yourself, I think, to stare into the abyss, eventually I think you can come to terms with it. Um, you may even actually come to love it. Not so much to love it in the sense that you want to do it, but you love the reality of existence that this should be part of it. Um, so that's my, that's the sort of where I was going with the thought experiment. And I'm fascinated by other people's um, take on it. Because it's not as open and shut as one might think. If you, can, if you can broaden your mind and remain in control of your experience of these things, um, you can come to terms with it if you want to do it. And if you want to do it for the re for the right reasons, I guess. If you want to transcend duality, all you want to do is see things the way they truly are. This can assist you. But again, I would say the best way to do that is to approach death in a healthier sense, i.e. approaching it under circumstances where nothing has to be killed against its will, as it were. Um, if anything, Kali God struck me, struck me as slightly overkill, whereas my Nikanika God in, I can never pronounce that right, in Varanasi, where the cremations take place, is kind of just right. It's respectful, it's, it's not really a spectacle, uh, it's somber, and you're just pondering it. You sit there quietly, very few people are talking to each other, and you just look, and you... You think thoughts like carpe diem and omnia transient. That uh, was the profundity of India for me, was watching the, uh, the cremations take place, and you're fairly close to it. Um, I found that very healthy, actually. Um, Life-affirming, even. 